Hello, we're the Nostalgia Critics. We remember it so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get sued. <laughs> uh, I'm, I am waiting for one of these YouTubers to just call me out and say, stop using our intros. But I think that they're not even gonna mind it too much. They, probably... they, they don't care. We're still good. <laughs> well, I'm sure, well, Dan and Aaron, they're probably just like, eh, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, ours is not as good anyway, so let's see if theirs is better. Oh, God, theirs is a lot better than ours. <laughs> And the Stouch of Critic will just be like, eh, whatever. <laughs> eh, I've been doing this for like 12 years. People have been biting my style this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. So welcome, guys, to another edition of Club Battle here on the Game Changer. I am, of course, your host, Nate the F. Great, joined here by the one and only Mr. Max Beattie. And this week, again, we're diving a bit into the Marvel Universe. Last week we talked about the first Spider-Man movies for different franchises, of course, Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man, Spider-Man Homecoming. But we thought we would do this week is go a little bit deeper into one of the franchises, specifically the original three Spider-Mans, of course, featuring Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, James Franco, and a bunch of other great cast members. This was the fran- the trilogy that really kicked off Spider-Man. Did it set the bar? Of course it did. Did it lower the bar in some cases? Well, we'll get into that because, yeah, there's <laughs> there's going to be a lot Spider-Man of... What about Spider-Man 3 now? What's that? What about Spider-Man 3 lowering the bar? I mean, uh, what? <laughs> we'll get into that when we talk about that. So we are basically going to be covering all three of the original Spider-Mans. And we're going to be, again, doing our ranking system on which Spider-Man movie was indeed the best. So let's not waste any time. Let's dive right into it. Let's start off with the plot. So obviously, when you have a movie, you have to have a good plot. Spider-Man, the first movie, pretty basic plot. Kid goes through everyday life, and he also gets superpowers along the way because he got bit by a spider, and just... It is basically what they try and do. They try to, you know, do the same thing that they've done with either the comics or the animated series. A lot of the stuff they've done is actually pretty spot on, in my opinion. But I don't know. How do you feel about the first Spider-Man plot? Um, well, uh, in terms of Spider-Man, I mean, none of them have been, you know super accurate to the comics. Like, in the comics, Spider-Man's first villain was, if I remember correctly, I want to say the, uh, the chameleon. Um, and he was, you know, it was the 60s, so of course he was a communist spy because, you know, 60s. Um, wasn't Green Goblin, but, um, in terms of, like, accuracy to the comics, the plot is accurate to the 60s style, the quote-unquote Silver Age, as it's known, you know, very campy, very cheesy, very over-the-top. Um, it isn't quite up to the Silver Age level of sheer insanity. feels a bit more like, the, you know, the 40s and 50s, the Golden Age, where, yeah, they were over-the-top and cheesy, but it was more kind of like a lot of stuff from the time period is very over-the-top and cheesy, especially to our sensibilities today. So it's pretty accurate um, in regards to that. And the story throughout, you know, it remains consistent in terms of how the characters, um, it remains tonally consistent, so I mean, you know, kudos and props to that. Definitely, definitely. And now we go on to Spider-Man 2, in which the storyline and plot actually gets a little bit more real, actually, because you definitely know that they are actually developing more of Peter Parker's character, as well as the stuff that he has to go through. He has to deal with, you know, jobs, he has to deal with rent, he has to deal with a boss who's a complete dick, it's J.K. Simmons, okay, that's an exception to the rule, uh, deals a lot with, Wait, serious? <laughs> dealing with a lot of, you know, just doubting himself because everything in his life is just going through a basic turmoil, it's everything going to shit for him, and just everything that went through the second Spider-Man definitely is one of those movies that I look at and think if they really wanted to do something that developed the characters more into what they were going to become, this was definitely the plot and the movie that did a pretty good job of doing that. Oh, I, I 150% agree. I mean, I, I, I talked about it a bit last time, and you know, I'll just completely clear the record here. I'm not the 
biggest fan of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. I mean, I loved them as a child, and if you go to my YouTube channel, I'm sure you can probably still find um, an old video where I'm, where hell, I was even, back in 2000, and I want to say 9 or 10, I was even defending Spider-Man 3. But this was the movie that I, you know, looking at it now, this is the one movie in the series I can definitely, you know, I can keep, you know, go back and rewatch just for the story, not for any of the other elements. And I like you said, it felt like, you know, in terms of being an evolution of what had been presented in the first movie. I agree with that, but at the same time, I kind of also think that it just should have been the kind of tone and style that the first and third movies were. Where, yeah, they've got the, the cheesiness. Like, I mean, for crying out loud, this movie has a scene where Peter loses his powers and is walking down the street just kind of happy, and it's actually playing raindrops keep falling on my head. This is it's a silly movie. But it had a firmer grasp on characterization and seriousness than the first two movie, first movie did and then the, than the uh, third film did. So um, I, I kind of feel like this is where the series should have been in those regards. But I, gotta, I will say this. For me, the anchor point of the plot is you'd think it would be, oh, it's a Spider-Man movie. It's going to be Spider-Man and his supporting cast, kind of like how it is in the, movie, in the comics. Now, if you ask me, the anchor point of this movie is uh, Doc Ock. Like, they, regardless of what you think of Molina's performance and how the character is executed in terms of quality, he is Doc Ock walk right out of the comics. Um, I mean, does he look like him? No, Alfred Molina isn't like a five foot two, almost completely bald, fat, super scientist with Coke bottle glasses. Oh no! If anything, he looked really freaking cool in this movie. Yeah, I definitely do agree with that. And we'll cover more on that when we talk about villains, of course. Uh, and you actually did make a smooth little transition into what would be the third one, in which, you know, looking at it for the first time, it was like, oh, this is kind of cool, everything's, you know, looking great, they got new villains, they got this, 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 but after watching it a couple times, it's kind of like they didn't know what they were really doing, in my opinion, because it started off, you know, just fine and happy, everything seemed to be going well, everything was going fine. Then there was one plot hole, and then another plot hole, then another problem, then this problem, this, this problem. And then it just reached a point where it's like, what exactly is this movie doing? It, it felt like you just could, like, if I was to watch it now, I probably would have left the theaters just scratching my head like, what, what exactly happened here? Because I don't feel like it benefited any of the characters. I don't think that there was too much that really helped the plot as much, and just everything just felt like it went to, I, I don't want to say complete shit, but it was on that verge. If they would have gone any longer, and if they would have gotten stupider, then it would be like, yeah, this movie was basically just, as uh, <laughs> Aaron from Game Rubs would say, this movie is a bunch of poopy-ass diabetes covered in chocolate feces. <laughs> much going on like it you know okay so we, we got you know harry osborne doing his whole thing is the new green goblin i'm like okay that makes sense that's basically been building up for two movies you know, that, that would have to come in this one it makes the most logical sense um so i got no problems with that uh peter getting the black suit well, that, 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 that works out too i mean Considering, I mean, that could be like a strong visual representation of, you know, all the stress he's going through, you know, him finally lashing out, and it's the suit giving him license to do it. Sandman. As soon as Sandman gets in there, despite the connections to Uncle Ben's death, that's where it just starts to get, okay... There's enough going on in this movie. I mean, we've got Harry. We've got, you know, issues with, you know, Mary Jane. We've got Spider-Man being beloved by the city. we got the black suit. Do we need Sandman? Fine. If you want to throw that in there, he can make sense, too. Venom. Regardless of how well-executed or not well-executed Venom was, Venom should not have been in this movie. It was way too soon. Um... Just Peter should not have gotten the black suit and then had Venom sh lose it and then have Venom show up and then have Venom be defeated all in one movie with everything else is just too damn much. 
Um, this movie probably would have been at its best if it just would have been about Peter getting the black suit, dealing with that, and then dealing with Harry. That would have worked out for the best. As for the movie being weird and cheesy and kind of stupid, which is what a lot of people complained about, my response to that was, didn't you watch the first two? These have always been weird and cheesy and kind of stupid. It's just got cranked up too far with this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh... I think that, you know, to kind of counter your point, if they would have, you know, probably not incorporated, you know, the whole Eddie Brock deal right off the bat, like you said, it just felt like it was a very loaded movie. If they would have just done like what they did in the animated series, maybe just have that moment where uh, Peter, you know, he's freed from the suit and the symbiote is off of him, and then just end it with, you know, Eddie Brock getting the suit and just that final image of just Venom popping out ending it right there to where you can have, hey, this is the build-up for Spider-Man 4. Now, obviously, that wouldn't have happened, but it was one of those things where it's like, it would have made more sense to kind of build off what you were saying. Oh, exactly. I, and, you know, they were talking about Spider-Man 4, like, oh, we want to do the Lizard or maybe the Vulture, and it's just, no, you should have, like, throw some hints like, you know, have Eddie Brock exist in this movie, but he's like a complete background character. Like, you know, they mentioned that, you know, Brock, you need to get your shit together kind of thing, you know, with, you know, him needing to get better pictures and whatnot. And towards the end of the movie, he's, it looks like maybe, you know, he's, uh, he might be getting fired. And then at the end of the movie, when everything's all said and done, or how you could have even waited until the next movie, that's where he finds him, or they find him, or they find each other, or whatever. And you could even put, in the fourth movie, then you could have put a really cool spin on the whole Venom storyline, where usually Eddie goes through all of his shit, you know, his life falls apart, he gets fired from the Daily Bugle, um, he gets into a fight with, you know, Peter, not Spider-Man, Peter, and then later, after everything's fallen apart, he finds the Venom symbiote. If you have him kind of go through a similar arc as Peter, but go in the different direction, it kind of makes them even more of parallels, even more of an arch-nemesis than he was in the comics. So when you rethink about that, it's the way they executed him is in the third movie is just, it's such a loss of potential. And you could have done a really cool fourth movie. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it would have had that nice, even uh, tone between the serious and then the more, uh, you know, wacky, Silver Age-esque antics um, that they want to go for, like it was Spider-Man 2. So... I think that's the big reason why a lot of people really don't like the third movie is just because it's so... You just look at the screen and go, there is so much wasted potential here. Like, why did they do Venom? Why did they have um, Harry lose his memories and then regain them and try to do this forced, stupid, love triangle, triangle bullshit? You know, why not just have him regain his memories and then gone after Peter's job, you know, kind of like tear his life completely apart, you know? You just you saw what they could have done. And for as much as I don't like the first movie, even the first movie would have done this. And it's just, ah, uh, it's, ah, uh, ah! Uh. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it probably did not need to have all those really weird love triangles deals. I mean, they do try to incorporate that from the comics and from the animated series. I remember that. But it was one of those things where it's like, is it really that necessary to have a love triangle no, yes, it just really boils down to just a giant question mark, but, all right, so, bottom line, which one had the best uh, plot, which one had the best story arc, in terms of, you know, which of these benefited the most, I think we made it pretty obvious, uh, I say Spider-Man 2 did a really good job with their plot. Oh, definitely, and I know to a lot of people here, you're rolling your eyes going, oh, well, everybody says it in terms of plot or whatever, Spider-Man 2 is the best one. And I'm just like, yeah, there's usually a reason for it. It had the most memorable storyline, for crying out loud. I mean, it did the most to further the world and the characters and hell. I mean, unlike the first one, I was actually laughing at the jokes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there were just a lot of pretty good jokes that went on during that movie that actually seemed like it connected. It wasn't forced. It was natural. It worked out. But, all right. I'm sorry. It's, it's a stupid, stupid... 
But when he spoke, when he and Doc Ock are fighting in the bank and he was at some damage, I'm just like, oh my god, that is such a, oh my god. They're not doing the sarcasm, but they're doing the cheesy one-liners. This is amazing. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we move on to the next category, which is the supporting cast. So, basically a lot of people would say, you know, well, that seems like it could be like a tie for all of them because they basically had the, all the same supporting cast. Well, in the first two, yes, you could definitely say that because you definitely do have, you know, Harry Osborne, you have Mary Jane, uh, you have Aunt May, who I will definitely talk about in just a bit because she definitely gets to be a very, she has a focal point in each and every one of these movies, which is cool, and they actually do do a great job of really developing her so much into one of those uh, parent characters that you could just look at and think, I know somebody that's like that. It's really cool to have that relatability in there. Um, the third one, though, I think it had, like you said, it may have been overstacked with all the characters that they introduced into it, but at the same time, they did have more fresh faces that they could have brought in. I mean, of course, they brought in Gwen Stacy, they brought in the police chief, they brought in Eddie Brock, they brought in the Sandman, uh, Flint Marco. They brought in a lot of these other characters into this to make the movie still really good and still find a way to keep it refreshed. They keep it, you know, top of their game. Was it crowded? Yeah. But at the same time, do you remember some of those characters? Of course you do. I mean, just a while ago, we were talking about uh, Stan Lee's cameo where he look, he's looking on with Peter and when he's making the announcement of Spider-Man's getting the key to the city and he just says, I guess it's true that one person can make a difference. Enough said. Even with that kind of a role in there, it's like everything there just felt kind of natural, actually. Uh, we may criticize the plot a lot, but at least a lot of these characters served a bit of a purpose. I mean, Gwen Stacy, she was kind of... She was kind of there to make Mary Jane jealous because Peter got hurt by her. Uh, police chief was there to basically tell them, hey, this is what was going on the night that your Uncle Ben died. Eddie Brock, of course, he's being the villain. Uh, but yeah, with the, with the first two, I think they they didn't have, you know, too many characters that they could add on. They wanted to just keep it at a, you know, low profile, which is fine, which is fine. But I think that, you know, when push comes to shove, and I'm actually, I'm probably going to hate saying this, but uh, I think I'd have to give the uh, supporting cast category to number three for having a lot more people involved. Hmm. I, I have to, I've, I've, actually, I've always kind of had issues with the supporting cast in these movies. Um, Aunt May's not bad. She's very, very comic book accurate. Um... I, I'm definitely not going to argue that one. I mean, she's she practically walked right out of the comic books. The actress was great. Um, her role in the film in the movies were, was always spot on. Um, I still say that uh, Spider the first movie gave us the best on screen uh, rendition of Uncle Ben that's ever been. Uh, Spectacular Spider Man the animated series doesn't beat it. Um, no offense. Um, I love The Amazing Spider-Man 1 the most, but still not as good as this. Um, Harry Osborn is great. Um, but then you start getting in characters like Flash and Mary Jane and the suits at Oscorp and a lot of the instant, uh, incidental, char incidental characters over at the Daily Bugle. Um, it, I feel like especially the first one, is very much a mixed bag in terms of uh, its supporting cast. Um, the third movie, uh, the third movie, I would argue that the acting is the best in terms of the supporting cast. But I personally think the best supporting cast would go to uh, the second film. Uh, I think that there's a lot go that give Mary Jane a bit more to do, especially you know deciding between uh, Jameson's son and Peter. Um, the, uh, the things that they have Aunt May doing during the plot, especially, like, you know, when they have the garage cleaning scene, where, you know, uh, the one kid t uh, takes all of Peter's old comic books, that was fucking hilarious. Um, <laughs> a lot of the people at the Daily Bugle started to give a bit more flesh out and whatnot. I, I feel like the second movie also had, uh, was able to put the most focus on the 
supporting cast. So I got to go with the second movie personally. Hey, fair enough. And uh, uh, two things that uh, I wanted to kind of touch base about that because you definitely did hit the nail on the head when you were saying that uh, when it came to like basically bringing that comic book character to life into the real world. Yes, the actress who played Aunt May in this one definitely did a spot on job, and she always had a moment in every single one of these movies where she definitely had some sort of life lesson and it really hits home. Of course, the first one, basically she's talking about how, uh, like everything that was going on between, uh, Peter and Mary Jane. Uh, the second one, as you mentioned, while they're cleaning the garage, basically talking about how everybody needs a hero. Everybody needs somebody to look up, up to. And of course the final one, her having that talk about how revenge is a poison to, to everyone where, you know, it's not healthy to have all of these kind of emotions built up inside of you. It will end up, you know, causing more harm than good. And I will agree yeah. with you on, on the uh, second movie about more development, especially with the bugle, because the scene that really stood out the most, and I actually think I watched it this morning or it was yesterday. Uh, the scene that stood out during that one was the scene with, uh, uh, JK Simmons, uh, J. Jonah Jameson, where he basically, at first, you know, he's just like, yeah, I won, I won, I knocked the spider out of its, you know, web, and, you know, he's happy, he's dancing, uh, there's that one weird scene in uh, Spider-Man, I think it's like 2.1, where he's actually dressed in the Spider-Man outfit, and he's just acting like Spider-Man, and then we get into a later scene where he finds out that Mary Jane's been captured, and he's actually showing a different side to him. He's basically saying, I feel bad because I feel like I'm the one who drove him out. I feel like I was the one who forced him to quit. It's one of those things where it's like, wow, you never thought you'd see the side of uh, J. Jonah Jameson where he's actually feeling remorse for something that he's done. Because throughout the, the first two movies, he was a guy who's just like, hey, I won and that's all that matters. This time around, it's just like, wow, he's actually admitting that he was wrong. This is... This is weird. And of course, that was a polar, bipolar deal because as soon as he sees the suit was gone and that the note was there, he's just going like, oh no, the thief is back. The criminal's back. Get me Spider-Man. And it's just like, yep, yep. He's back. He's back. <laughs> that was perfect. I, uh, I love that. Although, the one, the, the thing that really helps me nail Spider-Man 2 for supporting cast is actually something I think most people wouldn't think of when they talk about the supporting cast. Doc Ock's arms. The things have, like, a mind of their own. He's the active force, but they're, like, pushing him and nudging him, and the animators went, and, like, when they, whether they were CG or the scenes where the arms are puppets, they have, like, their own little personality, and it's just... It's creepy and weird and comic booky, and it's just, it's something I've never seen done with Dr. Octopus before, and I have never really seen much of that in a superhero movie. So, even looking back now, I'm just like, that is so cool and creative, and yes! <laughs> so, I think it, for me, stuff like that is kind of what pushes the second one um, into that category once again, just because it's. It's something that I, none of the other movies did, and it's just something so creepy and original. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, I do actually remember that, where they're all just basically talking to Doc Ock because uh, that chip in the back of his... Uh, in, in the back of his, his neck was, you know, basically destroyed. And actually, this is a perfect transition because we are going into the villain arcs, which, of course, Spider-Man 1, we could talk about... Green Goblin, or as we like to say, the uh, Power Ranger Reject. Uh, Spider-Man 2 featured Doc Ock, and Spider-Man 3 featured uh, Harry Osborn, Sandman, and Venom. Now, obviously, Harry Osborn is a bit of a, you know, it's, it's kind of on the fence, because at first, yeah, he's basically trying to kill Peter, and then at the end, he actually turns out to be saving Peter, but I think it's just one of those things where it's like, eh, technical, schmechnical. So we already talked a bit about Green Goblin, for the Doc Ock deal, it definitely was an eye-opener to seeing that. Because, obviously, if we watch you know, the animated series, like I did, or the you know read the comic books like you do, a lot of things that we definitely remember is that they 
didn't really talk too much about that, where I think it was just one of those things where it's like Doc Ock was naturally evil, and he was always wanting to, you know, do these scientific experiments because he wants to better the world, even though it's not exactly the best way to do it. But in this Spider-Man 2 movie, he was different because he was not, you know, just trying to better the world, but he also was under these, you know, temptations from these, you know, mechanical claws that were basically telling him, yet, you know, the scientific spirit was not wrong. It was good. It was fine. It was blah, 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 blah. And it just really created a different side of Doc Ock that I never thought I would actually see. And in all honesty, I thought it was awesome. I thought it definitely made for a very compelling story. It gave him motivation, which, of course, a lot of villains need. And for him, it just worked out very well. Oh, God, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, for what he is in the first movie, the Green Goblin isn't terrible. And Willem Dafoe acts his friggin' ass off. But there's just something about Doc Ock in the second movie. Something that just works so well. You said it. He's not just, yeah, I'm going to take over the world, Spider-Man. I'm sorry there, folks. I turned Doc Ock into Skeletor for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, was, he starts out as a very relatable dude. You know, he's you know he's brilliant um, scientist. I believe it was... Um, what was it? Mechanical engineering, I think it was. I can't remember specifically what, uh, what his degrees were in the movie. Um, but, you know, he had a loving place and worked together on everything. Um, I love the dinner scene where with uh, uh, Peter, Doc Ock, and his wife, where they're just sitting together talking. And, you know, like they're talking about, uh, like when uh, Doc Ock gives them the dating advice of, uh, you know, you want to get into a girl's heart, read her poetry. It works every time. Um, just little stuff like that really it, it made him it made him a sympathetic villain which is I mean you could argue there was something of that in Green Goblin but I don't know kind of hard to feel sympathetic for Norman Osborn but no, Doc Ock just knocks it out of the park um, Spider-Man 3 um, I actually do really like the design of the new Goblin like the kind of ninja snowboarder kind of thing. I don't know. I think it really works. Um, Sandman has uh, some of the best visual effects in terms of digital effects at the time. Um, again, he's kind of a sympathetic character. Venom, Venom just sucked. I'm, I'm not even going to mince words there. Venom just sucked in that movie. Um, it's going to sound weird. Um, if you want to call him a villain or just an antagonist, I would actually say that the best villain in the third one was Harry Osborn. He fit the most into the movie. He was the most proactive antagonist. He was just... It was just all over. I think he was the best one in the third one. But once again, I gotta go with the second one. I would argue Doc Ock's the best villain. Yeah, and I'll uh, agree with you, but I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the third movie uh, from, my, from my perspective. Like you said, you know, Harry Osborn in the third one, he definitely was one of those guys who was more proactive, he definitely fit the bill, he had the motivation, It just, everything was organic with him. Flint Marco, well, it sort of, kind of, he was kind of sympathetic, uh, he kind of, also, it was one of those things where it was like, dude, you could have just explained everything to begin with, and everything probably would have been okay, but I guess not, because that would be a waste of, like, five minutes of a movie, apparently. And then, like you said, just, uh, Venom, Eddie Brock, was indeed one of the biggest wastes of that movie. And, sorry to have to say this, but Topher Grace, he's no Eddie Brock. Let's face it, guys. Eddie Brock, when we see, picture him, he's, you know, muscular, he's buff, he does the workouts, he does everything like that. He's not some kind of, you know, pesky dweeb that could basically, you know, almost like chip a nail and be like, oh, no, or just be nervous about every single thing. Oh, God, that scene where, uh, oh, God, where him and uh, Gwen Stacy were talking, and he's just like, well, what about that great night that we had together? And she says, we had coffee. I'm like, wow, this just, this is totally like, Eric Foreman deal. They they put Eric Foreman in this movie 
N to the no, hell to the freaking no, just why do you hate me? Oh, we know you're going to see it because it's Venom. Nonetheless, why did it have to be told for grace? Just, I, I, t- I talked about this in uh, my remake when I talked about uh, rebooting Spider-Man 3, is that I would have kept it somebody who was like really buff, really muscular. I even tempted the idea of having Dave Bautista. Uh, I know he plays Drax now, but he would have probably been a pretty good uh, Venom, in all honesty, because this is a guy who could literally ba- basically you know, rip Peter, Peter Parker apart in the real world, and now he's got the symbiote that makes him even stronger. It's like, oh, crap, how are you going to beat him now? It's like, it's one of those things where it's practical, where it's like, already you can't, you have a hard time beating this guy just one-on-one, but now you basically have this guy have another advantage, and it's like, uh, how do, how do, how do we, uh, how, how, how's this gonna go down? Yeah, how's this, how's this gonna happen? I mean, I'll give him credit in one regard. A lot of people complained, oh, every time Venom talks, he pulled the symbiote back so you could see his face. I'm just, for me, I was just sitting there going, that, that, that's literally what he did in the comics. Anytime he spoke, especially to Spider-Man, he was pulling the mask back to, because it fucked with him. Like, that was the whole point. Like, I was actually completely fine with that. And, like, the design of when he's wearing the symbiote, it looks really cool, and when he does the Venom scream, it sounds really cool, but damn it, then there's the other, like, 90% of the character that's just wrecked. It's just, no. Honey, no. Sam Raimi, come on. You can't, what you... were you thinking? <laughs> was, was the studio interference, or did you just drop the ball? I... I don't really like either option, but I can at least understand studio interference. <laughs> yeah, I could totally understand that as well. So we go on from villain to what normally would be the love interest, but obviously the love interest is all the same. And in all honesty, I could say that basically to sum up, Mary Jane in these movies is a freaking roller coaster, and we're not going into that because, yeah, we're, we're just good. not going into that. We need to touch that. No. So, instead, we actually are going to be doing something a little bit different because, like I said beforehand, that the one person that seemed to really benefit from this uh, trilogy was James Franco. So, we're actually going to be picking which one of these Spider-Man movies actually had James Franco at his best. So, obviously, in the first one, he was kind of just the typical best friend, you know, always there for Peter, wanted to get the girl, wanted to impress his father, just that kind of deal, but at the end you definitely saw that something was going to be, that's something that you want to keep an eye out for him going into the second movie, and that was his line of, you know, Spider-Man will pay, I swear on my father's grave, Spider-Man will pay. Second one, of course, we still see a little bit of that resentment towards Spider-Man, he wants to find Spider-Man, he wants to basically destroy Spider-Man for what he believed was, you know, killing his father. And, of course, we see the scene where Harry has, you know, Spider-Man on the couch, and he just says, let's see who's the man behind the mask. It's revealed to be Peter Parker, his friend. And he's, of course, like, oh, oh God, what, what just, no, my, my best friend killed my dad, really? And, of course, this transitions into them having the vision of William Defoe in the mirror where he's talking to <laughs> to Harry Osborn and probably one of Max Speedy's favorite lines of Avenge me <laughs> just just let it, just going I, into I, the, I, I gotta admit that was just that's just Avenge me no and he throws like the knife dagger whatever the fuck it was through the through the mirror like perfectly and it's just ah oh, that, that that is pretty great and then we go on to Spider-Man 3, and now, of course, Harry Osborn, he knows that Peter is Spider-Man, so he toys with him a bit. Of course, we mentioned, as you mentioned before, he lost his memory, and just kind of really, it really kind of made the story just a little bit weird for him. But then when he got his memory back, that's when we saw the more sadistic, twistic side of Harry Osborn. Just everything that he did after he got his memory back, that was where it was just like, whoa, this... This guy is uh, not all 
not I wouldn't say like he's all there, but he's kind of one of those guys who's just like he he kind of knows what he's doing, but he also knows that he's being basically a lunatic, and it of course ends with him basically making the ultimate sacrifice, proving again that even though he thought that Peter was responsible for his father's death, finding out later on that it was his father who was responsible for his own death. Just going back, being a friend to Peter again, and just proving that, you know, like, friendship conquers all, something like that. But that final scene where he's, you know, talking with Peter, talking about how they are friends, and then him passing on was one of those things where it's like, this is, this is a very, very, like, touching scene, even though, you know, you kind of see him with all that, <laughs> that new, like, reconstructive face mask that he had on from the bomb explosion. yeah. I mean, it, it, there was a part of me that thought it took away from it, but it was one of those things where it's like, you know what, it's still touching moment because this is like, you know, a callback to the first movie where the two of them were really good friends, and this is just showing again that, hey, these guys are indeed friends, and they're very close. Let's just end it on a high note for the two of them. And it worked out. Yeah, I mean... It's going to sound weird... If I make the best James Franco performance or what have you in these movies, it would probably actually be the third one. He had the most to do. Um, it required him to play multiple facets of the character, you know, the hard edged, I'm fucking gonna kill you, uh, goblin at the uh, start of the film, the kind of confused best friend. Um, for a good couple of scenes, and then, you know, the manipulator behind the scenes, and then the self-sacrificing, uh, almost pseudo-hero at the end, and he pulled them all off. So I would actually go with the third one just on that point alone. Yeah, I fully 100% agree on that. I think, you know, the second one, he definitely was starting to really get that development stage, like we've mentioned beforehand, but it was at the third one where we saw him at his peak and at his finest. And even though people can say that, you know, there are a lot of dumb things that went on during that movie, that was one of those things that was basically the gem that you could find in that steaming pile of crap. And that being James Franco's fully developed Harry Osborne, and he put on a really good performance, as we mentioned before. It was great to see that. And, you know, has James Franco had a role like that since Spider-Man? No, but, I mean, he's still one of those guys who still has that kind of, you know, dashing look and the kind of manipulative deal there. And I think it all started with him being Harry Osborn in Spider-Man. So it's kind of cool to see. It's kind of cool where you could actually see that and think, oh, man, he probably picked that up at Spider-Man, you know, 3. And then there's people who are like, oh, yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> all right, so... We move on to the final category, which is indeed, which was the best Spider-Man? Which was the best performance of Tobey Maguire? So in the first one, we kind of hit on that. Basically, basic performance, he really started kind of just getting his, you know, foot in the door, kind of learning about his powers, learning about life in college and everything like that and really learning about real-life situations. In the second one, you definitely do see him a lot more struggling. And it's one of those movies that actually makes him more relatable, where people can say, like, oh, yeah, I've had to deal with this kind of deal where, you know, something's gotten away and it's cost me a job. Uh, I've had bosses that have treated me like crap. I had that... <laughs> you have a landlord that's always wanting rent, and just... <laughs> uh, and for all intents and purposes, there's probably at least one person in the in the entire world that's just like, oh yeah, I have a guy who talks just like that, who barely can speak a lick of English, but is still my landlord somehow. And <laughs> and, and again, and again you, you definitely see you know, all the trials and tribulations that he goes through with Mary Jane, where in the first one, he's still trying to, you know, still trying to just talk to her. Second one, we're still, it's like, you know, he wants to be with her, but once she finds out about who he is, she, he explains to her, There's, this is the reason why we can't be together, because then my enemies would know, and you would be in danger, and yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. The third one, of course, was the, oh, boy. I, do I dare say final nail on the coffin that was Tobey Maguire's career? Uh, I mean, he got work after it. He definitely 
still has a career. He's been in theatrical films, but in terms of being like a big blockbuster star, yeah. I, I, the, after this, that that was pretty much done. Because let's just explore the third movie now, shall we? Blubbering crybaby for almost about twenty percent of the movie. He looked emo for about thirty percent of the movie. He jived and danced and looked like he was just this uh, deal for like another too much percentage. And just, it just felt unnatural. Everything that went into it just really made you just look at it like, why would they, why would they do that? Why would they have hit him do that? I liked it in the animated series where, when he wore the symbiote suit, yes, it affected his attitude, but it didn't change like his outward appearance unless it was for like you know, chame- making him like a chameleon where he basically could change clothes, or he could do something like that. That was something I was thinking, you know what, if they did that, that was cool. But when they just decided, yeah, let's give him, like, an emo look, so that way it basically is, like, the same thing. I did like, again, when they showed that he had a different attitude, that was, that was fine. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess I can definitely say the, uh, one of the best parts of that movie was him and his landlord, where landlord's just like, give me a rent. Hey, it's free country, not rent free country. And finally, Peter Parker just screams at him. He's like, "Yo, get your rent when you fix this damn door!" Just what that moment right there. I'm like, "Yep, that's the symbiote. That's the symbiote talking." And just then, you would see him then going into this random deal where he's like thinking he's cool and just taking advantage of everything and just looking like a fr- complete. Oh God, the vi- I uh <laughs> I I don't think there's enough bleach in this world that can make me just forget that visual of him just strutting down the street, just snapping his fingers, doing like a jive, and then he ends up in a black suit, and he does the weird tango thing. It's like, what the f*** is this? Stan Lee, he's not dead yet, but he's his spirit is rolling in the dirt right now saying, what is going on with my Spider-Man? Just why? Can you at least shed some light on this, Max? Because I feel like I'm just... I feel... I, <laughs> I get what they were going for with the whole the singing and shit and, him, you know, dancing and fucking emo haircut and the, the black suit and everything else. I get it. It's like, oh, they're trying to, you know, the, the suit, it, it messes with your mind, it pollutes you, makes you an asshole, makes you kind of evil, you know, and it's just, <sighs> like, in the original comics, when they first introduced the Venom symbiote, it didn't work like that. It had no effect on a person's uh, thoughts. It didn't make them more aggressive. Uh, the thing that actually introduced that idea was the 90s animated series. And eventually the comic, it became such a popular idea that pretty much every incarnation of Venom going forward has done that. And hell, even in the comics, they retconned it. So yeah, it totally works like that. So I get it. Like it's supposed to be influencing his mind, drawing out the darker impulses. But it's just they made him such a pure, just nice white bread, milk toast little guy with Peter Parker in these movies that there's not a lot of quote unquote darkness to bring out in the first place. So being an emo jerk is about as far as they can go, I guess. Uh, but. <sighs> It's one of those instances where it doesn't matter how good of an actor someone is, the material is just... It's, mm, it's, mm, it's not, it's not going to help. It's not, it's not going to help. Spider-Man 3 was doing Tobey Maguire no favors. It really was not. So I think we're both in agreement about Spider-Man 3 being not exactly his best performance. So that just leaves Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2. Uh... Final thoughts on that? Which was the better performance? Oh God, um, you know what? I got got to keep us. I got to keep it up. I got to pick Spider Man too. He felt more suited into the role. Um, I felt like you know, like like I said with the example before, he actually was you know cracking a more wide variety of the one liners. Um, I mean, it's it felt 
he felt like a more I don't want to say relatable because he was supposed to be relatable part, but he felt like a more fleshed out, a more. Uh, it felt like the movie. Really, it felt like both the actor and the movie itself were really putting their own artistic stamp on. This is our version of Spider Man. You know, this isn't. Maybe it's not exactly like it is in the comics, but this is how we see him. And not, it never stood out more than in the second. Excuse me. Then in the second movie, so I, I gotta hand it to Spider, uh, his performance then too. I think with that, I will agree with you on that because, like I said, it was one of those deals where they definitely did try to make Peter Parker more relatable. They definitely tried to make him more more fleshed out, more like an actual person. Uh, and I think, you know, probably one of the best scenes that was on there was the scene with him on the train where, you know, he's saving everybody and they're, they basically carry his body all the way to the... All, all the way till, you know, to like, I think the middle or something like that. And everybody's just seeing his face. He's like, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. He's almost like my kid's age. And he has that look of absolute, like, petrified fear where he knows his mask is not there. And he's just thinking, this is not good. And everybody's just saying, like, we ain't going to tell anybody. It's just one of those things where I think that alone made it one of the more relatable stories where, you know, he's still young, but he's still trying to do the right thing, and everybody admires that, which is a very powerful message, especially in this world. If you do the right thing, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to notice that, and they're going to appreciate you for it. And, again, that's one of the things that definitely stands out the most when it comes to Spider-Man 2. So, with that being said, final tally... Spider-Man 1 with a heaping helping of, sadly, zero. Spider-Man 3 hitting it with three. And in a clear sweep, Spider-Man 2 with seven. So Spider-Man 2, we believe, is the better one of the series. And obviously, everything from the story to the development of characters to the supporting cast to, you know, the comedy to the villain to everything that they've done with Spider-Man 2 is definitely one of the best Spider-Man movies. If all honesty, if people knew what Spider-Man was, but they kind of want to know what a true Spider-Man movie really needs to be, obviously one would definitely be The Amazing Spider-Man, second one would definitely be Spider-Man 2. So for those of you that are definitely Marvel fanatics and definitely want to see what truly would be a good embracement of what you know theater can what the uh, movie theater can do for Spider-Man, which are the best representations to go, definitely go check out those two. 100% agreement, my man. And with that, you guys, that is going to end this round of club battle. It was another fun filled show. So thank you again, Mr. Max BD for being a part of this. And Hey, we talked about Spider-Man for two weeks in all honesty, not a bad thing, right? Oh, God, no, not at all. I mean, it could be worse. We could be talking about the fact that Suicide Squad got up. No, no, no. Oh, God. No, I... don't, don't go there. They got an Academy Award just for costumes and just for, and just for, jeez, God. I, that, uh... Really? That movie got an Academy Award for costumes? They got a cos- Really? I think it was for, like, uh, costumes and makeup, I think. I... I would. I just remember. I, that was like. It was like the only one that they got nominated for, and somehow they won. I, I. I mean, I guess. Sure. I mean, hell. I think it was like one of the Transformers movies was at least nominated for an award for like sound design. So I guess anybody can win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, trust me, we're going to get a little bit more into that and talking about the Oscars a little bit more next month when we get closer and closer to the Oscars. But, you guys, we're going to wrap it up for this edition of the Club Battle. Uh, you can always check out Mr. Max Beatty on his Twitter at AgentCooper1989. You can also give me a follow on Twitter at Real Effing Game. Give us a like on the Facebook fan page, which is facebook.com forward slash changing up the game. Tune in next week for another exciting edition of Club Battle where we put movies against each other and we see who reigns victorious. So for Max Beatty, I am Nate the Effing Great, and we will talk to you guys in the next episode. 
Adiós.